And I want to thank you all for joining tonight. I have a special guest with me tonight. I have JD with me tonight. My little nephew, JD, is eight years old. Hello. Hi. The fast, fastest man alive is what I, what I like to call him. So welcome, JD, tonight. JD, do you want to show everybody your T-shirt? Yeah. Look at that. He's got a Torah T-shirt. His mom, his grandma made this for him. It's beautiful. All right. Saints of God, we're going to get started here. Let's open up with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I just invite you to take over this meeting tonight. Holy Spirit, I just ask you to touch everyone that's joining tonight. And I, Lord, I just pray that transformation will take place in the lives of all you people tonight, Lord God. Lord, I pray that you comfort those that are mourning. Lord, I pray that you will deliver every person out of every situation that, that they are in right now. And Lord, I ask you to lead every one of us on a path to greatness. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. And saints of God, I want to thank you all for joining tonight. Tonight, I'm going to teach you about the path to greatness. Tonight is Monday, April 12th, 6 p.m., right here on Facebook Live on my channel, Destined for Torah. And tonight, we are going to continue in our series in the Scroll of Esther. In Hebrew, we call it Megillat Esther. Megillat Esther means the Scroll of Esther. And you can watch last week's teaching on Facebook or YouTube or on your favorite podcast platform, uh, and uh, Sister Jamila will post will post those links any moment now. Um, you can go to YouTube.com and, and search for Destined for Torah. You can go to Facebook.com like you are right now and go to the Destined for Torah page, or you can just go to DestinedForTorah.com and you'll find access to all the teachings that we've been given over the last several years. And I just pray that God will touch you mightily tonight. So last week I taught about under being under the wings of the divine presence. And we taught how Esther, and not Esther, but we taught about how Ruth came under the wings of the divine presence, where she came to a place where she completely trusted in Hashem. She completely trusted in God for everything. And that's the place that God wants to bring each and every one of you into, is a place of complete dependence upon Him. Whether you're eight years old like JD, or uh, um, regardless of how old you are, or, or how young you are, you can all come under the wings of the divine presence and come under God's divine protection. Amen. So this week we are going we are going to explore the concept of greatness, more specifically the path to greatness through the example of Ruth and her ancestry. And over the next few weeks we're going to talk about all the negative dispositions that Ruth had to overcome in order to become the great grandmother of King David and also to become the ancestor of Christ Jesus the Messiah. Amen. And it's through it's through the example of Ruth that you are going that you will will discover the greatness that's inside of each and every one of you. And even JD is going to as he's hearing this word tonight, JD is going to discover who who he is in God. Because every single day, he's going to learn more and more about God. He's going to learn about how God wants to use him. And he's going he's gonna to learn that God has a plan for his life. And God has a path of greatness for, for his life. And for each and every one of you as well, as we are all sitting here with, with JD's mom and JD's grandmother and my wife, Bobna, we're, we're all here praying for you and praying that you will discover your path to greatness. And God has prepared a personal and prophetic path of greatness for you. So your walk with God is a prophetic walk. It's a walk in which God is directing your footsteps. See, not one of us needs to live life aimlessly because we do have it. We do have a trajectory. We do have a clear path, and and no COVID virus, no 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 situation in life is going to keep you away from God's path. And God's going to keep you on that narrow path, and God's going to lead you into all truth. So I encourage all of you to be so open today and to know that I'm not your teacher. I may teach you some words and give you some instruction, but the Holy Spirit is, is the one that's going to implement what I'm teaching in your, in your lives. And he's going to show you how to walk on that, on, that, on, that, on that straight and narrow path, on that path where God is leading you and guiding you into your path of greatness. And, you know, J.D.'s walk of, uh, of greatness is not your walk. Every one of us has an individual walk, and God's going to lead you on your own personal and prophetic walk. Amen? So where do we first find greatness in the Bible? The very first place where I see greatness is found in Genesis 127. And everything that I teach in God's Word will always connect us back to Genesis. 
or to one of the books in the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. We call the first five books of the Bible the Torah, and the word Torah means, means instruction. And Jesus, as we learned about in John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And the word Word with a capital W speaks of Christ Jesus himself, and Jesus is the living instruction. Jesus is the living Torah. Amen. So in Genesis 127, this is where you, we first find mankind's destiny, both male and female. And we look if Genesis 127 reads, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. See, God is very specific when he talks about mankind's creation. It's not just male. It's not just female. It's male and female. And both species of the creation of mankind are part of God's image. And this word in his own image is not something that's, uh, it says, in the image of God created he him. Cre that word being created in God, it's being created in God's image is not something in the past tense. It's not something that just happened 5,781 years ago when Adam and Eve were created. It's speaking about our lives as well, and we are constantly being recreated and formed into God's image. And every time you receive God's word, every time you go through anything in life, especially when you're in God's word, you are being formed into God's image, and God's image is being formed in you. And every one of us is uniquely made in God's image, and my image is not the same as JD's image. JD's image is not the same as his mom's or grandmother's or grandfather's image. Every one of us is uniquely made, and, and we all have a unique image that God has imprinted inside of us. Amen? And Ruth, as we'll study about over the next few weeks, she discovered her path to greatness when she surrendered her life to God. See, many of us stop, uh, we don't stop seeking God after salvation. You know, we, we pray this in his prayer. We're familiar with Romans 6, 23. We're familiar with the scriptures about salvation and about being born again. But for many Christians, their walk with God stops there. But really, in reality, that's the start of our walk with him. And our walk with God is a walk of dying to self. It's a walk where we say, not my will, but yours be done. And that's exactly what Jesus did in the Garden of the Gethsemane when he prayed to the Father, Father, if, if, if it's possible, remove this cup from me. But then he goes through a complete death to self when he prays, but not my will, but yours be done. And that's the place that God wants to bring, bring us to, that we no longer live for ourselves, but we live after God's will. And we seek God's purpose for our lives more than what, more than what we want for ourselves. In Ruth chapter 1, verse 16, this is where Ruth experiences a complete death to self. And it reads, And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. See, many of us don't know of the sacrifice that Ruth ex uh, went through at this time. See, um, Ruth's husband had died, her father-in-law had died, her brother-in-law had died, and Ruth was known as a Moabitess princess, and Naomi really encouraged her to return back home, return back to her father's house. But Ruth was so set on converting, she went through a complete conversion, she accepted the Lord God of Israel as her, as her own God. She she embraced monotheism and and she, and she cleaved to Naomi, and she knew the suffering and the rejection and the pain her mother in law Naomi was going to go through, and she was not willing that her mother in law or her former mother in law would go through that suffering alone. She she chose to take up her cross, return back to Bethlehem in the nation of Israel cleaving to her mother-in-law and bearing the shame for her. Now, I want you to take that walk in your own journey because Jesus has called us to take up our crosses and follow him. And sometimes carrying our cross means that we're going to suffer. It means that we're going to be tested. It means that we're, that we're going to be willing to be ridiculed for our faith. For some, it may mean accepting martyrdom for their faith in Christ Jesus. 
But whatever God calls you to do, it's a walk of dying to self daily and taking God's will and taking his cross upon your shoulders. Not a literal cross, but figuratively speaking, that you are surrendering your will to Jesus. And you are following Jesus every step of the way. And it's during times like COVID that people fall away from the faith. It's during times of lockdown and times when churches are shut down that Christians and become lukewarm and choose not to serve God wholeheartedly. But but it's what we should do during the difficult times is that we should run to the cross and we should embrace the cross and 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 we we sh we should serve Him wholeheartedly. And and the walk that Ruth took is shows us how we are to walk. You know, Na Naomi was Ruth's mother-in-law. But we also have a Naomi in our life as well. And our Naomi is the third person of the Holy Trinity. It is, it, he is the Holy Spirit. And, like, and as Naomi guided Ruth along the journey, the Holy Spirit is here on earth because Jesus is the baptizer in the Holy Ghost. Jesus sent us the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the one, is like our Naomi, and he is leading us into all truth. He's our helper. He's teaching us. And he guides us every single step of the way. See, without Naomi's guidance, Ruth would have missed out on, on her destiny. Without Ruth's strictness, Naomi, uh, Ruth would have missed out. And sometimes the Holy Spirit will be very strict with us. He'll be very firm with us. Sometimes he will be tough with us, but he's always very gentle. But, it, but he, cares, he cares about us, and he, he wants to perfect everything that God has for us. See, we have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And God the Holy Spirit is right here on earth living within, within each and every one of us. And he is our helper. He is like Naomi to us, and he is leading us into all truth. But during the journey, Ruth didn't get destiny because she was a daughter-in-law of one of the great women, one of the greatest women in Israel, Naomi. She did not get destiny because of the people she knew. She did not come into destiny because she married the right person. To the contrary, she, she became a woman of greatness because she embraced the path of greatness. And she knew that the path to greatness was paved with responsibility. Winston Churchill said, the price of greatness is responsibility. And if you, if you want to become great in God's kingdom and you want your life to really count for something, your life to be something meaningful, then you must be willing to take responsibility. Ruth took responsibility for Naomi. Are there people in your life that God has placed in your midst that God is calling you to take responsibility, responsibility for? Maybe God has given you the honor and the privilege to serve in a ministry. Are you faithful and do you take responsibility for that which you are responsible for? Maybe you're an intercessor, a prayer warrior, a preacher, or whatever, you, whatever your role is in ministry. Are, 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 are you, are you, do you take responsibility for what the Holy Spirit has given you? See, the greatest moves of God that have taken place in history, and especially the revivals that I've studied in, in, in the Western nations, is it's because someone took responsibility and took on themselves the burden of the Holy Spirit. And they took that burden upon themselves, and they took on the burden to intercede for souls. And, and it's after such situations that great revivals broke out, whether it be in Wales and Scotland with the Hebrides revivals uh, in, in the Azusa Street revival. Wherever the revivals took place, it took place because somebody took responsibility. And what price of, did Ruth pay for her greatness? The price that Ruth paid was in her de decision to take responsibility for Naomi. Naomi was her mother-in-law. But since Ruth's husband, Naomi's son, was dead, she was no, th that relationship was no longer there. But you know what? R Ruth didn't care. She still took responsibility for Naomi, and she treated her better, better than even a mother. I mean, she took total responsibility for her, for her, took the shame for her, even went into the fields to glean, to, to glean for grain be uh, herself because she, she did not want Naomi to be put to shame. She rather, she chose to bear the shame herself. And her path to greatness was in her hesed. The word hesed, the way I spell it is C-H-E-S-E-D. The, you know, we translate it into English as loving kindness, but the more accurate definition of hesed 
is selfless loving kindness. That means when you know when Jesus says if someone tells you to carry a cloak one mile, you carry it two miles. And it's really that place where your loving kindness stops. And when you're when being when when demonstrating loving kindness becomes completely sacrificial, that is when Hesed begins. That means if 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 you only have two loaves of bread in the fr- in the fridge, and and your neighbor needs one one that you, that 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 you give it to them, even though you may need it in a few days. Hesed means getting up at three, four in the morning to go to the hospital to pray for a sick person when you're so exhausted and you and you have no strength. It's when when you hit that point of limitation, that is when Hesed begins. And Jesus has called us all to walk to go on that journey of Hesed because the path to greatness is paved with responsibility. And Jesus teaches us about the path to greatness. In Luke chapter nine, verse fifty nine and sixty it reads And he said unto another, follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go bury my father. Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury their dead. But go thou and preach the gospel of the kingdom of God. See, the path to greatness is a path of total commitment to Jesus. And Jesus was not teaching his disciples to hate their parents And he was not teaching his disciples not to bury their dead parents because to to give you to give a dead person a proper burial was a mitzvah. It was a a Jewish commandment. It's part of the Torah and and, and a given person, given a person the proper dignity in their death is, is something that's very honorable. And Jesus was not teaching his disciples not to obey the Torah, not to obey God's word. To the contrary, Jesus was telling them to keep all the commandments. But then he was teaching, then he's given a priority to the commandments because following God is the highest priority of all. Jesus is not saying don't bury the dead. Jesus is not saying don't don't take care of your parents. What Jesus is saying that your relationship with me is a priority. That's the that's the number one thing in your life. And Jesus was teaching his, his disciples that following him means that learning from him would take precedence over every other endeavor. Does does that make sense? If it does, please type amen. And so, and by Ruth completely being sold out to God, she, not only did she become the matriarch in Israel, but she restored honor to her deceased husband, her deceased brother-in-law, and her deceased father-in-law, Elimelech. And see, the The blessings that you get for serving God are exponentially greater than anything you can do for God. I mean, look at the way God blessed Ruth. The reason why Ruth wanted to marry Boaz was to restore honor to her her in-law's bloodline. She wasn't doing it for herself. She had no idea the blessings that were coming to her. She she was out gleaning in the fields thinking that she was just – saving her mother-in-law from shame, but she did not know that she was paving her own path to greatness. And to be called the great-grandmother of King David, to be called the ancestor of Christ Jesus the Messiah, is is a tremendous honor, isn't it? A tremendous honor. And she had no idea the path that she was paving for herself. And and, and when, when you take a walk of selflessness and you embrace a walk of embracing Jesus, It's in that journey that greatness will come to you. And over the next coming weeks, we're going to talk about Ruth and Abraham. We're going to talk about um, Adam and Eve. We're going to talk about Cain and Abel and many others in the Torah of how their paths were either paved with greatness or paved with just the contrary. And your path to greatness is a path that is paved through selfless acts of loving kindness. And, and when you put somebody else above yourself, that opens the door for greatness to come to you. See, we, we, live, we, we live in a selfish world. We live in a world where it's all about me. We live in a world where what, we ask the question, what's in it for me? And I'm not saying that we shouldn't seek things for ourselves, but I think we should flip our, the priorities. And we should look out for others more, more, more than ourselves. If I can give you a personal example, there was a, a certification that I desired in, in my professional field. And, and I, I always spent my time helping others in, 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 
in the field, but I never spent the time focusing on my development to achieve the certification. But along the journey of just helping others, God put me into a place, into a, into a position at a company and brought me into contact with a person that helped me to achieve that certification that I so long for. And what I've learned is when, when, when you step out on a journey of selflessness, God will open doors for you and God will bless you exceedingly. And the blessings that, that I have received far outweigh anything that I've done for anybody else. Amen. So I just encourage you to flip your priorities because your, your path to greatness is, is, is accomplished through becoming selfless and being, becoming more focused on the needs of others. That's one reason why we give our, we give our tithes and offerings. Is, is so that we can look out for somebody else's benefit, that we can take care of, a, of an orphan, that we can take care of a homeless person, that we can take care of, of those that are struggling around the world. And, and when we do that, we can exp- uh, in, in God, who's so loving, will bless us far more than what we've ever done for anybody else. Now, the walk, the, 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 the walk to greatness is a journey from tohu and bohu to tov. Sounds a little bit strange, doesn't it? We're using some Hebrew words here. We're going to go, and Jaden, I'm going to ask you to say this with me. The journey from tohu and bohu to tov. Now, last week, we shared a little bit about tohu and bohu. And we see these words in Genesis 1, 2. And the earth was without form and void. In Hebrew, the, the two words I want to emphasize would be the earth was without form, meaning tohu, and void which is the word bohu in Hebrew. And darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. See, so you, all of us may go through times in our life where we feel that our destinies, that our purpose is without form and is void. You know, it, it could be through a divorce. It could be through a death in a family. It could be the loss of, you know, you, you could have maybe a loss of a husband or, or a wife, a lo- loss of a loved one. It could be a, a devastation in a business or a career. And, and we, we all come to places in life in different ways where we feel like, Lord, my life is not worth me. My life is not worth living. For some, it may mean that, uh, the loss of a ministry. Um, and, and these situations cause us to feel like we're in darkness. We feel like we're rejected. Ima- imagine what the millions of Jews felt under, in, under the rule of Nazi Germany, uh, un, un, under the cruelty of, of, of Adolf, Adolf Hitler the darkness that, that they went through. And I want you to know that in the midst of that darkness, God's purpose is, is being revealed. And I believe it's because of the Holocaust, and I believe because of the sacrifice of the six million Jews that now uh, the entire world can receive Torah, including the Christian community. And I, and I believe we owe a great debt of gratitude to those that laid their lives down for us. And the earth was without form and void. That word... T- Without form in Hebrew is a word tohu. It's a word that means an, ex- an expression of, of astonishment and desolation. That a person wonders and is, and is astonished at the emptiness therein. Imagine a, a, a spouse, maybe a wife married to a husband or a husband married to his wife for, for 40, 50, 60 years. And, and, and they lose that spouse. Imagine the emptiness that person would go through. Or imagine a, a, a child that, that, that lost their parents and the emptiness and the loneliness they go through. See, even the midst that tohu, God will bring about purpose. And then the word bohu is a word that means emptiness. It means void and it means waste. And sometimes there are times in our life where we feel that our life is uh, without meaning. I have talked to people that have spent years um, see, uh, pursuing careers and looking for that big break have sought positions in Hollywood, sought positions where they're seeking that opportunity, but the opportunity never came. And, and, and that person will go through a period of time feeling like my life, I have not accomplished anything in my life. But I want you to know is the greater the, dev- the, greater the devastation, the greater the glory God has for you. And, you know, and, and God can only trust so many people to go through that kind of hurt because not everyone will make it through that kind of devastation. But through God's word, through the anointing and through the help of our Naomi, 
the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, he, he will bring us out of our places of devastation. He will bring us out of our places of hurt. And I want you, as you read this word with me, and as we go through the book of Ruth over the next few weeks, is I want you to allow the Holy Spirit to be your teacher and your helper and your guide. He's going to guide you into all truth. He's going to lead you, lead you to the foot of the cross. And he's going to help you on this journey. And from all the years I've been in the ministry, I have not met a single person that has had a perfect life. I have not met anyone that does not have flaws. I have not met a single person that that has everything perfect. I, mean, I have not met the Brady family, the, the Brady family yet, the Brady Bunch family yet, or the Waltons family. I have not met a, a perfect family yet, myself included. Every one of us falls short in, 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 in certain ways. But I want you to know is that God is not looking for perfect vessels. God is looking for broken vessels. God is looking for, looking for yielded vessels. That vessels that would say yes to God. And when, and when we fail, we repent quickly and we, we return back to God quickly. It, you know, it, it could even be, a, it could be a husband that committed adultery. And, 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 and that person, that husband acknowledges that sin and repents and, and returns quickly. No matter what you've been through, no matter what, how, how far you've fallen, our goal should be should be to return to Jesus, Amen. And and He is the repairer of the ruins. He is the healer of relationships. And the only person I can work on is myself. I cannot change anybody else. I cannot change my wife Bhavna. My wife Bhavna cannot change me. Uh, it's it's uh, it's I I have to make a decision to surrender to the Holy Spirit and allow Him to work in me, Amen. So I I cannot bring anyone up to my level to what what I consider. My standard, because every one of us is a unique work, and God is working within every one of us. My, you know, we, we pray for one another, we encourage one another, we support one another, and we guide one another. But it, but it's up to us to yield to the to the third person of the Trinity and to allow the Holy Spirit to do what He wants to do in us. Now, as I'm teaching you tonight, as the Word is going forth and the Holy Spirit is your teacher, the prophecy is the vehicle used by heaven to transform your tohu and bohu into tov. The word tov in Hebrew means good. If you look at the, at the creation story in Genesis 1, after every creation, Jesus, I mean, God, God the Father says, it was good, it was good, it was good, or it was tov. And every time God does a work inside of you, he says, it, it, it was good, it was good. Everything that God does in you is good or tov. It's a work of good. God will, God will not do anything in your life that is not for tov. Sometimes God will strip things away from us. Sometimes our, our careers become more important to us than God. Sometimes our possessions and our houses and our vehicles become more important to us than God is to us. And sometimes God may strip things away from us for a season so to cause us to return to him. And, and God's stripping is not because he's mad at us. To the contrary, he loves us so much. And he, he wants us to have no other gods before him. And he wants first priority in our lives. Amen. And Naomi went through a stripping. I mean, Naomi didn't make all the right decisions herself. Elimelech made a horrible decision when he bailed, when he left Bethlehem and went to Moab. And because he was the greatest leader of that time in that, in that particular area, the judgment that came to him was the most severe. And as soon as they got to Moab, God struck him dead. And, inst and the family should have returned to Israel at that instant. They should have known this was God's judgment. And God was so merciful, the two sons continued on for 10 years in that land, and God struck them dead after 10 years. See, they, they, they did not learn. And, some, and I'm not saying that you're going to be struck dead if you don't obey God, but you will experience some form of death. Not, maybe not a physical death, but sometimes you, you're going to feel like your life is tohu and bohu. You'll feel like your life has no purpose. You'll feel like, Lord, there's something missing in my life. Because so I'm telling you, without service to God, that there is something in our lives that we feel is missing. And God wants to bring us all to a place where he wants us to experience life in the fullness of joy. He wants us to feel like we, we have a purpose. He wants us to know that we have a calling. And often the way we come into our purpose is by serving him and by serving others. And sometimes we serve him through serving others. Remember I told you about prophecy is the vehicle to discovering your greatness? 
We learn about that in 1 Corinthians 13, 9, and 10. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away. And what that saying is in part is as you, as, as you are coming and being formed into God's image in you, according to Genesis chapter 1, 26, 27, 28, is what you're discovering is God's image in you. And as you receive prophecy, even as you study God's word, as J.D. is holding a, a Bible here, as you study God's word, you are going to discover who you are in God. And, God and, and that prophecy is revealing to you what, who you are in Christ Jesus. Now, let's talk about Tohu and Bohu in Ruth chapter 1, verse 1. See, because Ruth went and Naomi went through their own journey of Tohu and Bohu, they, went, they came from formlessness and, and void. So let's read Ruth chapter 1, verse 1 together. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. See, and we need to pay attention to every single word that we read in this verse here. First thing that we see here is it was in the days that the judges ruled. And this is roughly over, I think, almost a 400-year period. And then we see there was a famine in the land. And th there were two types of famine taking place, as I shared last week. The first type of famine was a spiritual famine. And th there was no reverence, no respect for the leaders. And the leaders that were ruling really did not know how to lead the people. And, and so th th there was a famine. There was a political famine. There was a spiritual famine. There was no hunger for God's word. And another type of famine was, uh, uh, of course, the, the physical famine. There was no rain. And during this time, Elimelech was a ruler in the land. He ruled in Bethlehem, Judah, the, the very same area that King David was, was born, the very same area that Christ Jesus, the Messiah, was born. And Elimelech ruled. But, and during this time, there was such a famine that uh, people in, that, in, that village, in those villages came to him for help. But Elimelech was so stingy, he would not share his wealth with, with his people. And he, sh and, he, and he was blessed with so much wealth because God expected him to take care of his community. But he was so stingy and only concerned about himself that he took his immediate family, his wife and, and, and their two sons, and they bailed the place that they were called to and went to Moab, the neighboring country. Moab today is known as Jordan. And so, and the name Elimelech, because in the person's name, you can learn what their destiny is. The name Elimelech means let kingship come to me. And, El and according to some rabbinic opinion, Elimelech thought he was to become the first king over Israel, but his people would not receive him. And because they would not receive him, he, 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 just, he, he, left, his, he left his people behind. That, 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 that's one meaning. I believe, and that this is also another opinion, that if Elimelech would have stayed and been faithful in the land and taken care of his people, he may have become the first king of Israel, because his name was let meant let kingship come from uh, let kingship come to me, and I believe that God may have called him to be the first king, but because he was only concerned about himself and his own immediate family, he he missed out on his destiny. And so, 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 so they left. And then let's look at Ruth chapter one, verse two. And the name of the man was Elimelech, which means let kingship come to me. And the name of his wife, Naomi, meaning pleasant. And the name of his two sons were Malon and Kilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. Now, I want you to imagine this for a second. Imagine naming your kids Malon and Killian. Let's say years from now, um, JD gets married, and and they and, and he has and he, and he has two sons. Would JD name his two sons Malon and Killian? I don't think so. Do you know what Malon and Killian mean? I'm going to tell you. Malon and Killian mean sickness and disease. Can you imagine? And Malon means sickness and disease. Kilion means destruction or complete annihilation. It's almost like the, 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 the two sons were named Tohu and Bohu. 
There's no way that JD would name his kids that. And there's no way that Ella Malik and Naomi named their children sickness and destruction. So sometimes when we, we see names of people in the Bible, it's not always their literal name. The names often allude to their spiritual condi condition. And Malon and, and Kilion were in a place of, of what we call tohu and bohu, sickness, disease, and destruction or complete annihilation. And Elamelech's name, of course, means let kingship come to me. And what, what Samuel is teaching us, Samuel is the author of Judges, Ruth, and, and much of 1 Samuel. And what Samuel is teaching us is that when, when, we, when we step out of God's will, when we step out of God's purpose, then guess what takes place? We come into destruction. Sometimes we become so materialistic and we become so indulged into our own, our own lives that, and that we forget about God. And that's a very dangerous place to be because then we open the door for tohu and bohu in our lives. But God is so merciful because merciful, all of us fall short from time to time. And God, God's going to cause us to see the light and, he, and he's going to restore us. Amen. Because not one of us lives a life of, a, of, a, a, of a, a, a path to greatness from A to Z without making mistakes along the way. Sometimes our walk is a bit, uh, you know, a bit of a jigs, uh, you know, it's a bit up, it's ups and downs along the way. But whenever we fall short of God's glory, God will restore us. Amen. Aren't you excited about that? God will restore you. And I'm telling you, God, God is so easy with us that when we repent, he, he, he restores us so quickly. And so, and because of Ruth's obedience and because of Ruth's responsibility and because of her walk of selfless loving kindness towards Naomi, Ruth became the great grandmother of King David. And she, I mean, she, I mean, in her bloodline is kingship going all the way to Christ Jesus, the Messiah. Now, let's talk about Ruth for a moment. Let's talk about Ruth and Orpah. Ruth married Malon, and her sister, Orpah, married Kilion. Now, now let, uh, actually, I'm sorry. Malon was, Malon was married to, um, to Orpah, and Kilion was married to, to Ruth. Who were Ruth and Orpah? They were princesses. They were the daughters of the king of Moab. So the, these two ladies were royalty. They were princesses. And they married into Israelite um, nobility, royalty, by Marion, Malon, and Kilion. And when Ruth said, I will, I will, Naomi, I will never leave you where you live. I will live. Your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die. She gave up, she gave up her royalty as a princess in Moab and chose to live like a peasant taking care of Naomi in Bethlehem. She had no idea that royalty was in her as, as a matriarch in Israel. See, when you surrender your will to God, your life becomes like Naomi. Naomi's life means pleasing. And when you submit to God, you become pleasing. As J.D. submits to God, his life becomes pleasing. And how many of you want to please God above all else? Amen. You know, we like to please our parents. We like to please those that we serve. We like to uh, appease our, we like to please our pastors. We like to please our employers. And how much more so should we desire to be pleasing to God? And like Naomi, we can all become pleasing. And Ruth, a Moabitess who came from one of the most depraved nations on the, in the world. She came from a nation that was forbidden to convert to Judaism. And because of her hesed, because of her selfless loving kindness, she was accepted into the household of Israel and became the, the, the ancestor of royalty. And in the midst of your darkness, God is saying, let there be light. In Genesis 1-1, we read about that we, and the earth, in Genesis 1-2, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And then he, then he says, let there be light. And in the midst of your destruction, in the midst of your indistinguishable ruin, in the midst of your tohu and bohu, God is saying, let there be light. Amen. And the Spirit of God is hovering over your destiny. The Spirit of God is, 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 is working in you to do the work that he wants to do in you. 
In Genesis 1, 2, it says, And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. The, wherever the, the Word of God is, wherever the Word of God, wherever the Word of God is, there the Spirit of God is moving. The waters represent God's Word. Even tonight, as you are receiving God's Word, the Spirit of God is hovering over the Word that's being delivered to you. And the Spirit of God is, is performing the Word that is being delivered to you. Amen. And he and he's moving over that place of ruin. He's moving over that place of destruction in your life. There may be someone that's watching tonight that's bound up in, in drugs and alcohol, but God is moving over. The Spirit of God is hovering over your place of devastation, and he's bringing you deliverance. I encourage all of you to receive the deliverance and the healing that you so long for. Allow him to do that work because he's, he's, he's prophesying over your destiny, and he's saying, let there be light. And the light shone in Ruth chapter 1, verse 6. When Ruth said, I'm sorry, when Naomi said, then she arose with her daughters in law that she might return from the country of Moab. For she heard in the country of Moab how the Lord had, had visited his people in giving them bread. That bread is not just physical bread, it's spiritual bread. And she learned and heard that God's word and, 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 and a revival was taking place in the land of, of Bethlehem, Judah. And she returned to that place where there was bread. And the Spirit of God is hovering over that place of, of the face of the waters. And that is the place of bread. And God's going to, and, 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 and through, the, through the word of God, that, which is the bread of God, your healing is, 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 is going to take place. Amen. Jesus said when he was tempted by Satan, he, he told Satan, man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And that is our bread. That is the bread that, sust that sustains us. And that is the bread that's going to bring us out of every destruction, even through the COVID pandemic that, that, we, are that we are going through right now. And the, the light of Messiah is being, re is being revealed in the midst of your darkness. In Genesis 1-3, it says, And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. See, this is not the light of the sun. Because the light, because the sun wasn't formed until in, until later, this light is, is is the light of Christ Jesus. When God said, "Let there be light," the very first thing introduced into the creation was Christ Jesus Himself. And then, as you read through Genesis chapter one, we already talked about, and and, and it was good. It was good. We read we read that seven times in Genesis one, and there were ten utterances in creation. And God, every time we read, and God said, that is one utterance. Each one of these, and God said, is one of God's utterances. And we have 10 utterances in, in the creation. Well, if you, go, if you go to Exodus, when God gave the 10 commandments, God, we read about 10 commandments. So the 10 utterances in creation parallel the 10 commandments. And, 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 and God is going to reveal his will to you. He's going to give you his word. And he's going to bring you, he's going to give you a destiny, a purpose. And as you come into this new year, coming into Pentecost, in the beginning of the counting of months, it's 50 days from Passover to Pentecost. And on the 50th day is the day in which the Spirit of God descended in the upper room and the 120 spoke with, with uh, unknown tongues. And years before at Mount Sinai, Israel became a nation when God spoke the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai. And God's going to reveal a destiny and reveal his purpose to you on, on Pentecost. Amen. Now, I'm going to go ahead and close here, but what I do want you to know is that testing is the vehicle that God's going to use to propel you into destiny, and God is calling you. And the question I want each of you to ask yourselves, and this will be, be, be my closing scripture from Genesis 3, 9, and the Lord God called unto Adam and said to him, where art thou? And that's the question I want you to ask yourselves tonight is, Lord, where am I? Lord, am I living in your purpose? Lord, am I doing everything that you have called me to do? Lord, are, they, are there any areas in my life where I need to work on? You know, we all may not be perfect like JD, just joking. We, we all have work to do. But every one of us is, is, is on a journey, amen? And all of us can ask God, God that question, God, where am I failing? Lord, wh what are the areas that I need to work on? And you know what? That's a question that God will always answer. Because it's a selfless question. And God, God's going to help us in that journey. Because during these 49 days, 
sometimes we call it 49 days of destiny. Sometimes we call it 49 days of character refinement. The, 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 both statements are true. But during these 49 days, counting, counting to Pentecost, these are 49 days in which God is going to perfect things in your character. And, and he's going to cause us to die to certain things in our lives. So that we so that we may receive the blessings that he has for us. Some of you may think, well, this is what God has for me. This is the path I'm to go on. This is the ministry that God's calling you into. But then you need, need to ask your, yourself the question or ask God the question. God, is this what you have for me or is this something that I want for myself? And sometimes God will cause you to die to what you want because he has something greater for you. Because 100% of the time, what God has for you is much greater than what you have planned for yourself. Amen. And Ruth and Naomi went on that journey, and you are going on that journey as well. Boaz went on that journey. And I want every one of you to, to be open to God's work in your life and allow the testings of life because, because testing is the vehicle that God will use to propel you into destiny. And I just ask you all to be open to that. In just a moment, I'm going to go ahead and close. I'm going to close in prayer here. But I, I do I do want to share I do I do want to I, I do hope you enjoyed tonight's service. Um, if you did, I encourage you to subscribe, share, like, and comment to sh to show your support. And there are several ways you can connect with us. Um, you can go to youtubecom slash c slash destinafatora. You can go to facebookcom slash destinafatora. You can go to destinafatora.com, or you can go to anchor.fm slash destined for Torah. So that there are so many ways you, you you can connect with us and you can receive the teachings that we have delivered over the, over the last several years. And um, I just want you to know that, I mean, uh, that we care about you. We love you. We teach this word because we want you to grow in Christ Jesus. We want each and every one of you to come into your high calling in Christ Jesus. 